Welcome to Call TV one more week. We are today at Dino Trace offices and we are going to talk a lot about what is it and how is it to be a CDO in a company with more than how many employees? We have 1,900 employees as of today. Mm, how many offices do you have? Around the globe, kind of 80 offices, so okay. I didn't count them recently. <laughs> okay, perfect. Mm. So let's begin and welcome to Call TV. Firstly, what does Dynatrace do? Yeah, so Dynatrace really enables customers who all undergo uh, their own digital transformation to really move from a classic IT into a modern cloud-based um, autonomous cloud. Okay. What, what I mean with this is that all those customers today um, have their two, three, four releases a year in classic enterprise software. They all move now to Azure. This is why they buy cloud environments, whether it's public cloud or private cloud stacks. And now the challenge is with the new agility, kind of, yeah. you know, you release now multiple times a week, yeah. everything is changing. So classic monitoring approaches, a classic approach is to even manage that environment fall short. Mm -hmm because of the new complexity with all those microservices, everything is interconnected, customers don't know what's running there, how it's running, what is the impact to the customers and the end users, and how to orchestrate all this. And this is where we help customers to get the visibility, get the answers okay. through artificial intelligence. And with these answers, they can then automate the entire IT infrastructure to get to a level where even they can self-heal the application so that okay. they do not need big operations environment to keep applications running, but actually they automate everything to be able to build new capabilities because this is what everyone wants to do, build new apps, new capabilities, okay. new usability. Okay. What differentiates Dynatrace from the different competitors that are already in the market like New Relic, and, uh, like Elasticsearch, Logstash and Kibana and Grafana where I can also have a dashboard with metrics and so on? So one fundamental difference is that Dynatrace is the uh, newest generation of all of those platforms and it's the only okay. one that provides answers and not data. Okay. And this is why day one we built in uh, a uh, artificial intelligence engine that is actually deterministic because also the data quality matters in order to translate them into answers. Which kind of data do you collect? How do you collect this kind of data? And how do you process in terms of giving answers? Yep. So that's a, um, a key asset is data quality. And this is why we collect them ourselves, primarily through the means of what we call the Dynatrace One agent. Okay. That is an agent that you throw in one command line to install, and from there it auto-discovers uh, auto everything, the mm -hmm. entire full stack. So we know exactly what is a um, CPU metric, what mm -hmm. is a um, mm -hmm. Kubernetes internal metric, and mm -hmm. so forth, and send this data then to Dynatrace but it's then um, way more than a correlation. In fact, what we do is also, because the agents discover the topological model mm -hmm. that we call the Dynatrace Smartscape, mm -hmm. that provides a real-time dependency model of everything in, in the vertical stack, as well as horizontally, all the way to the end users. This is a super important differentiation that instead of needing to correlate, oh, there's a CPU spike here, oh, and there's mm -hmm. a response time spike here, so maybe there is a correlation. Mm -hmm. No, we don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. We know 100% for sure because of this topological model, mm -hmm. oh, here is an end user issue, we infer down, oh, okay. here's in this Kubernetes cluster, this instance here in this line of code, actually the root cause that has bubbled through 15 microservices in between. And instead of a thousand false alerts, you get exactly one problem and know how, how it uh, is tied together. Let's talk more about um, how Dynatrace works in terms of teams, for instance. They are multiple Dynatrace labs. So in the R&D side of the house, we are uh, 650 employees and almost everyone is working in the central European time zone. Mm -hmm. 
So we have labs in Poland and Austria mm -hmm. and here in Barcelona. And that is very important to me because um, we do two major releases every month, okay. or basically major release every sprint. Okay. We drive innovation constantly. So it's important that we can do daily stand-ups even okay. across the labs here. And also um, it is that um, over 600 people check in in one and the same code base, in one and the same product. And this is a challenge on its own. It's not just many people and 50 different projects. How do you structure your code base in terms of there are more than 600 people mm -hmm. working on the very same mono mm -hmm. repository, I understand? So how do you mm, orchestrate all that in terms of allowing the people work mm, with autonomy without merge conflicts every day and so on? Yeah, so this is clearly one of the uh, biggest challenges and there are uh, a few <coughs> key elements to, to tame that. Um, one is giving the responsibility back to the engineers even about production. This is why we run already for five years now a no ops mm -hmm. mantra. Mm -hmm. This means we have um, to build code in the way that it is all self-healing mm -hmm. and all the time um, or in the event when there is a production outage. So right now it happens about every other month we have an issue uh, that the self-healing can deal with itself then actually the this is fed back to the engineers and the engineers then create additional self-healing also the engineers own access to production systems in a safe way so they see every day oh this is the feature that is from a last sprint actually usability is not bad or worse so taking this responsibility is one of the key most important vehicles what do you understand by self-healing in terms of mm -hmm. mm, 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 i will ask you pl to please put an example mm -hmm. a specific example of an issue that you have mm -hmm. over the last month or something mm -hmm. like that where the same healing mm -hmm. have behaved as you expected and solved the problem by itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, self-healing means um, at the macro level, for instance, when Amazon shoots instances, uh -huh. it doesn't matter to us even across multiple availability zones, um, so that for customers everything is always available. And on smaller levels it means, for instance, when a, um, <coughs> the customer has in its own network um, a, a connectivity issue mm -hmm. that there is technology mm -hmm. in our agent that it does automatic auto routing to somewhere different and that's all built in uh, um, or that when an internal deadlock occurs that we self detect mm -hmm. this and self remediate so mm -hmm. these are many details mm -hmm. where it's actually engineering work mm -hmm. to remediate that but it also means that you use for instance Dynatrace answers to couple this with business information to understand when should you um, uh, instantiate additional instances of your services because the classic mm -hmm. approach is oh response time goes down so let's spawn more instances but the reality is instances cost money mm -hmm. so the reality is you always need to combine sort of this IT knowledge with business knowledge and mm -hmm. this is also where we help with Dynatrace in the autonomous cloud effort that we do customers to make this decision properly that's business means. Okay and how do you decide w mm, where do you put the efforts of each of your teams I mean which is the last feature that you are proud to be mm -hmm. launching or mm -hmm. something like that and how did you decide to build this feature? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one interesting um, approach is that we make architects responsible for production because when you architect a scalable architecture then you should not be just be proud of oh this is my cool mm -hmm. Kubernetes cluster no but actually make it work and when there is an issue that self-healing doesn't kick in then you are the one mm -hmm. who needs to improve that and this means also that architects are at the same eye level mm -hmm. as product managers because in okay. the classic setup is oh the product manager no push feature push feature no the customer wants this and that no we have this culture where actually now we negotiate with every sprint now what is now more important the non-functional versus the functional capability so this brings a very different culture 
which is especially important for us because we need to have um, higher availability, more robustness, higher security um, than any of our customers' platforms mm -hmm. and higher scalability as well. So, so this is very unique from mm -hmm. this. And how do you work, standpoint. for instance, with mm, things like user experience? Mm -hmm. I mean, your dashboard and so on are quite good in this in these in these kind of areas. So, how do you work mm, the user experience mm -hmm. in your teams? Yeah. Um, so we have. In terms of user experience, a uh, central team that creates um, the key concepts for user experience and manages consistency, but then each and every engineering team has then an embedded user experience expert working part of the team to make sure that they live and breathe it are part of the use cases. And having the user experience expert n n built in each um, team, mm -hmm didn't it become a problem in terms of not having enough work pool for this very specific person? Yeah, so this is why this is not a 100% or let's say a, an engraved forever kind of um, role. It's more, let's say, the embedded UX person is there for five sprints and then maybe joins a second team, works on both teams in parallel okay. and sort of this is more dynamic, but in, in general, being in, in an agile, no op centric R&D, everything is more dynamic and, and is rearranged. The, which is the, the best challenge that you face day to day as a CDO or of a company like mm, so huge as Dynatrade? So our biggest challenge, honestly, is right now we grow so much with our customer base mm -hmm. that growing the engineering teams at the same <coughs> pace is obviously key. I mean, this is why also this Barcelona lab is so important to us. We hire only the best of the best people because uh, we create software that no one else has built ever before. And it's also our declared goal that we build far better software than the guys on the west coast because i'm european and they want to <laughs> build here the software that is that is um, definitely beating them those guys over there don't you hire juniors too? no it's always about the mix okay. um, um we actually have even a, um, a ratio factor about the number of leaders uh, we hire versus juniors because there's always a tendency to hire more juniors okay. because it's easier um to get them but no it it is the proper mix that's the only way to which to is scale. The, which is a proper mix for you which is this ratio where do you put the the number uh yeah um, I don't have the exact number in my mind. Okay. It is it's the not the definition question of what you define as a leader. Um, but it's about per 20 employees, you need a super executive type of leader and per seven employees, you need a strong leader. Right. And then you need in the mix of this an additional factor of um about five to one for a technical leader and and then additional kind of other forms of leaders because leaders not only mean for us that you have people under you a leader is anyone who leads from a technical viewpoint and you can be an individual leader the point is always to me as a leader someone who sees the problem, sees the context, business context of the company, of the customer, and then creatively comes up with new approaches to tackle a problem in a way that uh, no one else has done it before in a way and that actually works out. One last question. Mm, what do you think about the, the industry in Barcelona? the technical industry, obviously, in terms of recruiting, you already said that is your biggest challenge that you are facing right now, mm -hmm. in having to grow at, in terms of developers at the same pace of business growth. So how do you see uh, the these kind of things in Barcelona, the recruiting, for instance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Barcelona is by um, the culture of the city, um, an extremely great fit because we are disrupting the market as much as Steve Jobs back then disrupted the uh, cell phone and mm -hmm. PDA and camera market. 
with the new unified approach mm -hmm. the same is what we do and we actually create software that is consumerizing enterprise software because suddenly software needs to be very cool mm -hmm. in this city obviously sprays this kind of culture that we want so this is one great fit and the other part is um, I know that smart engineers want uh, smart challenges mm -hmm. and yes I mean for many people it's fun to build a little app and kind of yes after four sprints you can go live but clearly the software we build is it needs to scale to environments with hundreds of thousands of servers and millions of customer visits per hour we have challenges to tackle in artificial intelligence, in scalability of cluster, self-healing maintainabilities. There's so many technical and algorithmic challenges that this is actually attracting uh, strong engineers. And this is also why here in Barcelona, um, we will find that people join us just because of the fact, oh, this is now strong, deep technical engineering and um, coupled with also being a global company and um, a company that yeah, is growing. It's that's for it's sure that that for sure that you have an attractive challenge, but why to, to choose Barcelona and mm -hmm. not in whatever other city around mm -hmm. the globe? Yeah, I clearly see in Barcelona, this is the right cultural kind of modern vibe that is important because you always need to be forward thinking. Mm -hmm not this is how you do it no mm -hmm. we invent how it's being done mm -hmm. so um this means also barcelona is the city that attracts that kind mm -hmm. of folks i have also to say it's clearly not because barcelona would be cheaper so mm -hmm. no, no 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 not at all it's all about innovation mm -hmm. and getting the best people and, and this is what Barcelona is providing to us. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So thanks a lot. That's it. That's all the time that we had. So um, we have to thanks a lot to you. And thank you for your actually time. for having me. And, and I really appreciate it.